There's a great story about Stephen Hawking, the famous astronomer. He once met a comedian, a stand-up comedy artist, and the comedy artist asked him a question. He asked him, Mr. Hawking, am I right to suppose that actually what you are saying, that there are parallel universes where you and I also exist? And Hawking said in his characteristic voice, yes, it is. So the comedian went on and he said, well, would it be possible that there's a universe where I am actually smarter than you? And Hawking said, yes, it is. And it is also possible that there is a universe where you are actually funny. <laughs> I'm telling you this because I think sense of humor is proof of intelligence. And I'll tell you even more, sense of humor is, to me, key to innovation. And today, I'm going to hand over those keys to you. And I'm going to do so by linking neuroscience, Jewish culture, and a great cosmic joke. So, here we go. First thing is laughing. What's the secret about laughing? Laughing is proof of humor being present. So, we're wondering, where does it come from? And to show you just that, I brought a small clip. And uh, you have to look at it very carefully and let yourself go with it. Here we go. It's little Michael having fun with a piece of shredded paper. <laughs> now, the first thing you notice is that you are laughing because little Michael starts to laugh. So laughing is contagious. It's uh, in some aspects worse than flu and even worse than Ebola. So the second thing is, why is little Michael laughing? Now, researchers have been breaking their heads about this for 3,000 years, and uh, notably philosophers have been thinking about it. But of course, as philosophers do, they came up with no solutions and a lot of questions. <laughs> so, <laughs> then the, the last few decades, neuroscience came into the picture, and a fascinating book was written by these three gentlemen. You're seeing Daniel Dennett, Matthew Hurley, and Reginald Adams. They reviewed the research. It's, uh, most interestingly, it's a philosopher, a computer scientist, and a psychologist. Sounds like the beginning of a joke, but it isn't. But uh, they uh, went to review the research, and this is what they found out. You're looking at this. This is what's happening right now in the inside of your skull. This is not an animation. This is a 3D image of an actual functioning human brain. So what you see happening here is threads being formed, change of cells being connected by electrical current, and that is what makes meaning in our brain. That is how we make sense of the world. We're making connections in our brain. And whenever a new connection occurs in between two fields of your brain that lie wide apart, you get a nervous reaction, and that nervous reaction is laughing. And laughing is there because it generates dopamine. And the dopamine makes information travel ten times as fast through your brain as normal. So laughing is a knowledge booster. Laughing is learning boost. And it seems to be a trick of evolution to tell us that learning is very good for you. And learning is pleasant. And that's what they tell us when we go to school when we're young. They tell us, you're going to have fun at school. It'll be nice. And all the other children. And then they put us in buildings like these. And they wonder why we're not laughing anymore. <laughs> so humor is proof of an aha moment in the brain. And I thank the German language for creating this word, the aha erlebnis. 
the aha moment in the brain. And that shouldn't surprise us, because aha is, of course, haha spelled backwards. <laughs> so, this is fascinating because. The element of surprise is actually what lies at the center of the joke. So, this mechanism occurring in the brain is mimicked by making jokes, by what we do when we craft jokes. A joke essentially is a story, and I'll tell you one just to show you. The Dalai Lama was visiting New York, and he was a bit hungry. So he looked around, and he saw on uh, Times Square, he saw this uh, vendor who uh, uh, had these tofu hot dogs. And he went there and he said, hey, uh, I would like a hot dog. And uh, the vendor said, yeah, what would you like with it? And the Dalai Lama, being the Dalai Lama, he said, I would like a hot dog with everything. <laughs> so the, the vendor gave him a hot dog of to with tofu and everything, and the Dalai Lama handed him a hundred dollar bill. And the guy, the vendor, put the $100 bill in his pocket, and the Dalai Lama said, hey, don't I get some change? And the vendor said, hey man, change comes from within. <laughs> so there's a joke for you. Essentially, it's a story, and your brain, being a prediction machine, will try to foresee the outcome of the story. You are associating about the Dalai Lama in New York and what he could be saying after that. And so the story in your head goes straight forward, and then I come around and I bend it over at some point to some point you're not expecting. That's what a joke does. So if we know all that, why aren't we joking all day? Why aren't, why aren't we doing all this all day? Well, there's two problems. Of course, a joke by definition, by the way it's constructing reality, defies dogma. So any people who are in the course of uh, uh, dogmatic thinking, they are bound to be offended by jokes. And, of course, we didn't have to await the tragic events in Paris to see just that, because people who do uh, this profession, people who are cartoonists, people, stand-up comedians, all over the world, from uh, China to uh, the USA, from Egypt to uh, Mexico, are persecuted because of what they do, because of how they reveal truth. And uh, the second problem is that people say that making jokes is a question of talent. You have to be born with it. Well, is that so? I don't think so. Let's look at some people who have this talent. Here we got Woody Allen. Here you have Mel Brooks. And here you have Louis de Funès a French comedian, for the somewhat older people amongst you. Now, they have something in common. All three of them are Jews. And it's interesting to see that at some point in their career, they all made fun of their own culture. Now, am I saying that only the Jews possess the talent of humor? No, not at all, because there's uh, uh, other ethnic groups that really have a joke culture. Uh, for example, the Irish have a very good joke culture, a very broad joke culture. And in West Africa, the, the tribe of the Mandingas are famous for their funny stories. So it's not exclusive to the Jews, but the Jews done something special. They built a knowledge base around it. They wrote about it. They made these enormous compendiums and volumes about how to write jokes. Even this gentleman, Sigmund Freud, not really known for his comedy work, shall I say, um, he, uh, he wrote a book about the nature of the joke and how to make one. So what you can say is that the Jews are very conscious about the force of the joke. And 17 years ago, I interviewed a rabbi in Antwerp about Jewish jokes. And I asked him, what's the secret? And he told me, listen, you might know that we have a rather wrathful God. He's called Yahweh. Some people call him God, others call him Allah. He's a rather wrathful character. And he gives us all these strange rules. And in order to deal with those rules, we make jokes. 
because we have to learn how to deal with those rules in real life. That's what a joke is about. So a joke begins when there is injustice, something illogical or something untruthful. untruthful. And a joke is a point of resistance against suppression. That's what jokes are in Jewish culture. Now, if we stand there, we can say, okay, the Jewish know this. Can we learn this? Can we acquire this? Well, I'm defying you. Yes, you can. So I'm going to give you my three-step methods that I use daily to craft jokes. Now, I'm going to warn you before because as a, a famous British comedian once said, Jimmy Carr, he once said, you know, explaining a joke is like dissecting a frog. Nobody cares and in the end it's dead. <laughs> so, take care. Practicing your comedy reflex. Step one, change your point of view. So what you want is a straightforward story that bends over at some point. And the point where you want the audience to arrive is the punchline. And that is the aha moment. That is the moment where the audience would say, oh my God, that's clever. I never looked at it like that. So that's where you want to go. If you want to go there, you have to start a story from a different point of view. You have to mislead the audience with a setup that's going somewhere completely else. So you have to construct colliding stories. You have to change your point of view. Now, we can, we can give you an example of that. For example, there's been a lot of aggravation in Germany about the, the Greek point of view about repaying their debts, understandably. Now, you could say, if we make a joke of that, we have to change our point of view. We have to put ourselves in the shoes of the Greek. And if you do that, you can, you can fantasize about a meeting between the Greek Prime Minister and Angela Merkel. And the Greek Prime Minister could say, for example, hey, um, we have this great idea, Angela, uh, to get some new funds. We're going to charge one euro to every politician that misuses three Greek words. And Angela would say, what Greek words are they? Oh, uh, it's simple. Democracy, hypocrisy, and chaos. So that's a very simple joke with a change of point of view. The second step, you need to be aware of ambiguity. Because if you want to make a story that bends over and you want the audience to be with you at the end of the story, at the punchline, you need a point where you can turn around. And that point is a word or something, an object, that can, be, uh, that can exist in both stories, but have a different meaning. And that's a turning point. We call it a connector, this turning point. And a connector can be anything. Um, for example, if you go back to the Greek situation, uh, I once was talking to the Belgian Prime Minister, the Belgian Minister of Finance, and I, I told him, I said, listen, uh, I don't understand why, we, why we're so amazed that the Greek uh, don't, don't want to pay back their debt. I said, the, the Greek, they have all these kinds of strange of traditions. They, for years now, they have been uh, making foreigners pay to visit their ruins, so... It doesn't work, okay. <laughs> My son warned me for this. <laughs> no, you need a turning point. Another turning point could be, if we talk about the Greek situation, eh? uh, it could be, well, listen, the Greek have a great tradition. They brought us the Olympic Games. But then it was a warning sign, actually, the Olympic Games. What's the flag? It's five zeros. So that's an object having a meaning in both worlds. Now, you might say, and the third step is, you have to exaggerate your imagination. You have to really make it big. You have to fantasize about real situations where these stories could happen. So, now you might say, well, if this is the case, how is this going to help us in innovative thinking? What's, what's this about? Well, I'll tell you the story of 
cosmic joke. It is the story of this gentleman, Albert Einstein. He was a joker. He, he also was Jewish, of course. And uh, in the 1950s, he once met Marilyn Monroe. I don't know if you heard this. He, he really did. He, he, he met Marilyn Monroe. Uh, for the younger people in the house, Marilyn Monroe is the Katy Perry of the 50s. <laughs> so Marilyn Monroe said, Mr. Einstein, wouldn't it be great if we made a baby? It would have your brain and my looks. And Einstein, Einstein said, yes, of course, that would be interesting. But what are we going to do if it grows up and it has my looks and your brain? <laughs> so he was, a <laughs> he was a great joker. And he already was in 1919 when he started thinking about the theory of relativity. And at the basis of the theory of relativity was something he did not understand, something illogical in nature, which was movement. He said, we are on planet Earth, we're moving at 300,000 kilometers an hour, and we are not feeling this, we are not seeing this movement. So he said, movement, you, if you look at it from different points of view, it has different speeds. How does that happen? So you see, the start of the theory of relativity is already the structure of a joke. It has the basic structure of a joke. It's a story bent over. Now, in order for the story to work, he had to find a turning point. He had to find a connector. And he went to see for it in physics. And he found that Newton uh, put down time as a fixed unit, and through time, we measure speed. So he said, well, what if we looked at time not as a fixed unit, but as an elastic unit, as a, sub, uh, as, as a collection of moments that can exist one after the other, a bit like a film pellicule. And even when it's pa it's, it makes movement together, but when it's passed, it still exists. Let's look at time like this. And then they started doing the math. And that took about 10 years. Interestingly, in those 10 years, there was this person, Karl Valentin, a Bavarian comedian, who made a joke about it. He said, ah, it's great, this new uh, thing about time. You don't need a watch anymore. You just go out in the morning, you look at the church, and then you remember the time for the rest of the day. And so, the basis of this uh, reasoning of Einstein was the structure of a joke. And after 10 years of uh, calculations, of course, they found this formula. Now, what it all leads up to, in the end, is that humor leads to new truth. And therefore, it is very important. It is a very important value, being funny. It is a very important thing. And I know we should not uh, make inflation about new human rights, but I would say that being funny is a fundamental human right. And we should cherish it. And we should protect it. Isn't it? <laughs> and maybe we should go to the UN and ask to include it in the, in the Declaration of Human Rights, the right to be funny. No, because when there is no more humor, there is no more thinking. And that's why it is so important to stay funny. Are you wanting to stay funny? Well, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs>